Alaska is one of the most unique states in the nation. It is by far the largest state in the country by land area, water area, and total area. And it's over twice the size of its closest competitor in Texas. At the same time, it's also one of the most sparsely populated states in the country. Its total number of residents is below states like Rhode Island and Delaware. In fact, more people live in cities like Charlotte or Columbus than in the entire state of Alaska. However, this isn't for lack of beauty. The natural landscape of the state brings travelers from all over the world, from mountains and forests to wildlife, to outdoor activities like skiing, biking, and kayaking. Alaska is one of the most diverse and beautiful areas in all of North America. It's also been home to incredible economic productivity for decades. In the early 20th century, before Alaska was even a state, businesses such as the Alaska Steam, Coal, and Petroleum Syndicate sought to build refineries and capitalize on known oil seeps in the rugged territory. Other companies soon followed suit, and by 1920, the U.S. Geological Survey began producing reports on the economic promise of Alaska. Transportation was at first difficult and expensive, but by 1946, the survey was launching exploration programs, and in 1957, a commercial well began testing at 900 barrels a day. In 1968, the largest oil field in North America came into operation, and a few years later, the Trans-Alaska Pipeline System made it economically feasible to ship huge amounts of oil to the continental United States. An oil rush soon followed, generating billions of dollars of economic activity since. It was within this context of this rush, as well as Alaska's new membership as a state, that Governor Jay Hammond sought to ensure the Alaskan commoners benefited from the rush on natural resources of the state. Knowing that many native Alaskans struggled with the harsh climate and the higher price of food and goods than elsewhere, Governor Hammond established the Alaska Permanent Fund to ensure they received a cut of the profits. By 1982, the state government began paying out a portion of the oil profits to all citizens in the form of what the government called a dividend. The purpose of this fund was to keep money away from normal state government operations and instead to put a mixture of constitutionally protected savings away as well as direct payments to citizens. The government could tap into the reserves during a crisis while citizens could use their portion for whatever they wanted. Initially, Governor Hammond wanted to reward long-term Alaskan residents with a higher dividend than newcomers, but the Supreme Court struck that part of the measure down, and so any person living in Alaska for a year or more receives an equal payment. The amount of the dividend has fluctuated over the years, but it has still been paid out to all Alaskans to some extent each cycle. Alaskans are free to use the money how they wish, from goods and services to investing in education with programs like those set up by the University of Alaska. Because of the over 35 year history of the dividend, many politicians and candidates herald the Alaskan dividend as a model for other states and even nations. Some journalists have called it a socialist miracle and praised the fact that employment has remained stable with the dividend in place. And so, is all well and good with the Alaskan dividend? Does it prove that a universal basic income works? Well, not exactly. Though the fund currently maintains a surplus, serious problems have occurred over the years, especially when the revenues from natural resource extraction drop. For example, in 1999, oil prices dropped to below $9 a barrel prompting the Alaskan state legislature to forecast sharp budget deficits. Needing money for operating expenses, the governor, lieutenant governor, and numerous state legislators asked Alaskans to allow them to spend permanent fund money on government operation purposes. The citizens voted no by an overwhelming 84%. Fortunately, a few weeks later, the price of oil rose back again, up to $60 a barrel, and the crisis was averted. Today, however, the situation is much worse. Alaskan oil production has fallen drastically over the past 10 years. It is no longer the country's leader in oil production, and Alaska now falls below states like Texas and North Dakota in annual production of oil. Current forecasts predict Alaska's oil revenues to remain stagnant for the next decade or more. A major reason for this is because the U.S. Energy Information Administration estimates that Alaskan oil reserves are less than half or what they were when the dividend first started. Simply put, the oil is starting to run out and with it the economic engine that fueled the permanent fund. Alaska, of course, 
has other natural resources, including coal deposits, natural gas hydrates, as well as the potential for new resource harvesting, like hydroelectric, wind, and geothermal power. Many of these initiatives, however, are underdeveloped or incapable of supplying the type of revenues Alaskans have historically enjoyed. In 2016, then-Governor Bill Walker held a press conference stating that Alaska had $4 billion in budget deficit and that he was forced to veto half of the annual dividend to citizens. His approval rating tanked, and soon after he chose not to run for re-election. The problem continues on, however, and last year for the first time, the state legislature dipped into the permanent fund reserves to fund normal government operating expenses. So for the third year in a row, the government is in the process of reducing the budget and slashing the dividend by legislative action. And yet, even with these cuts applied throughout the state government, Alaska is operating at a $1.2 billion gap in what its officials describe as a tremendous deficit mode. Perhaps these issues would not be so dire if Alaska's social problems were addressed by a healthy infrastructure that could afford these type of reductions. But, despite the permanent fund and all the wealth generated in Alaska over the last half century, unfortunately, the state finds itself among the worst spots along a array of social indicators. Reported rape in Alaska is three times the national average, with 59% of adult Alaskan women suffering from intimate partner threats and violence, and 37% suffering from rape or sexual violence. Sexual assault has been described as an epidemic in Alaska. The same can be said for substance abuse, where illicit drug use by young Alaskans, especially those from the 12 to 17 age range, is among the highest in the country. Studies of the permanent fund show a 14% increase in substance abuse incidents the day after the dividend pays out each year, and a 10% increase in incidents over the week following. And then in terms of suicide, Alaska's rate has unfortunately been climbing in recent years, rising 13% from 2011 to 2017 to make Alaska the second worst in the nation. The government has its work cut out for it, trying to support communities and churches to address these problems. And yet, at the same time, for the government, its education, law enforcement, and healthcare budgets are all being slashed to historic lows just to maintain the dividend. And so, what are the implications of Alaska's use of the permanent fund? On the positive, what you see is the good intentions of Governor Hammond among the rush of natural resources of his state. Rather than letting the citizens get run over by the scramble to exploit those resources, Governor Hammond secured a portion of the profits for everyday citizens and their income. At the same time, Alaska's experience shows just how dangerous a universal basic income policy can be. As many Alaskan journalists and historians have noted, the permanent fund has permanently and fundamentally changed the relationship between Alaskan citizens and their government. Essentially, once instituted, the redistributive effects of UBI become the primary purpose of government. This furthers or exacerbates the class warfare between wealthy businesses and citizens. In the case of Alaska, the state government is now dependent on natural resource exploitation, and of course the businesses who do it, in order to maintain some semblance of the dividend. Higher taxes and restrictions are all on the table to generate more revenue, which may carry the side effect of either taxing the same people who receive the dividend and need it the most, or scaring away those businesses into shifting operations to other states or locations for production. Therefore, those who would tie the interests of other states or the country to a similar policy should be warned of Alaska's struggles. When basic income is tied to a finite resource or a bubble, anything short of an ending wealth, the long-term effects can be financially catastrophic. At the same time, and as I argued in my previous video, none of this appears to benefit or even really touch the true social indicators of human health. To truly make a difference for those deep human struggles, including sexual assault, violence, and suicide, to foster the true human connection, you need something a lot more powerful than a dividend.